Well, thank you, Fred. Um, we have uh, a little over 15 minutes for questions. When I was potting murderers in New Guinea as a 22-year-old, I was comfortable about them going to jail in New Guinea because they learned a trade, they learned the lingua franca, and they emerged after one or two years pretty useful citizens. I have to say that I don't think very many of the prisons of Australia would meet that description. I think that, uh, look, you're going to hear from Fran Bohm over the next couple of days. Listen to what she and others working on the social gradient of health and the social gradient of, indeed, many of these ills in society are saying. Building prisons is the American way. 2% of working age males in the United States are in jail at any one time, I'm told. 2%, not bad. It's a growth industry in Western Australia. We jail Aboriginal people at, I think, 17 times the rate of non-Aboriginal people. I mean, if, if these are matters which should make us very angry, very angry, because they are inexcusable, they are inexcusable results of our failure to conduct sensible policies over the long term to commit the resources, commit the people, and basically, let's say, a failure to educate Aboriginal people so they are confident in two cultures. That, in my view, is the fundamental underlying thing, and until we do that, we're dead. Next question. Uh, lady here. Um, my, my question is, I guess, if there is actually anything that's going to happen, as you say, about something positive in terms of, of teachers, qualified, highly skilled, people who are motivated to go, but my experience with people I know is they come back quite burnt out and there is so little support for them uh, institutionally. So they're encouraged to go, but they come back with feeling that they've achieved so little, and that is partly due to the structure. Um, there is absolutely no doubt that it is possible for Aboriginal people, just as possible for Aboriginal people to get an education as anyone else. Chris Sara, George Hewitson, there are lots of people who have done it. Missionaries were doing it two, three generations ago. There is a beautiful Aboriginal education policy written in Western Australia, adopted by the Ministerial Council for the period 2005-2008. As far as I can tell from the way schools are run in my state of Western Australia, where they wrote the thing, I don't think any schools ever read it, or that the policy has actually been applied. Of course schools can't do it all on their own. But I have to say that well-led schools, and Chris Sara demonstrated this at Cherbourg, and the recent principal of the school at Halls Creek demonstrated it, a well-led school can make a difference even under the most adverse circumstances. But if you're a solitary teacher, that I think is very tough, and I have absolute sympathy for people who suffer from burnout. I'm engaged in a, one of my voluntary capacities with a, an organisation that has now 14 projects around Australia, and we are regularly helping Aboriginal kids to finish year 12. Last year we actually got to 50, isn't that pathetically small? But 40% of them went to school or other, to uni or other tertiary studies, 40% went to apprenticeships and the rest went into jobs. What we do is give them a bit of pastoral care, we have a homework centre and we spend a few bucks. Much less than the people in this audience would have spent to educate their children at St Peter's or wherever, wherever much less. But until we take seriously the educating of all underprivileged Australians, we're going to go on having the sort of ghettos you've got in southwest Sydney. You've probably got a few of them here. And quite honestly, I wish I had some of the politicians from the left, who used to chide me so much when I was supposedly from the right, were a little more serious about the education of disadvantaged children, including black children, and providing the supports you need to give them a decent future. But your, your teachers should see if they can find external support. It, 
if you're in a really isolated place, it's difficult. But where, for example, there are mining companies, they've been so ready to join in enrichment programs. There are organisations like my own. There are organisations like the Clyde Footy Academy. There are lots of people trying to find ways of providing that external support. And we just need to do much more of it, much more of it. Uh, yes, uh, Mohammed Yunus uh, came up with the idea of the Grameen Bank from Bangladesh, microenterprise loans. How transferable do you think that system is to Australia? I think it's more difficult in remote Australia because you don't have a general market economy or a market tradition that you might have in the Philippines or Bangladesh or wherever. But interestingly enough, some of the banks, for example, the National Australia Bank, is getting into that area of finance lending. Um, there are a number of... Uh, Rio Tinto is engaging now with the uh, traditional credit union. Uh, National is uh, engaging with the, um, I forget what it's called, the, tr the credit union in the north of Australia. And I think that finally the finance industry is really trying to come to grips with how it can contribute. And that's one of the things that is getting active consideration. It's a little bit ironic to me that our foreign aid program has promoted microfinance in overseas countries, but we've not seen that as a federal government initiative here within our own community, within our own failed state. So yes, I think it has a place. But I think it's hard. You won't just pick down the model and just pluck it down Bangladesh to you and the Moo. But I think it has got a place in the spectrum of things that the finance industry needs to do. I should declare an interest. I'm on the, now on an advisory committee for the National Bank on that stuff, and my brother chairs the bank. So this is a very small country. Um, Fred, I'm involved in remote area service delivery in Western Australia and um, work with an agency, the Uniting Church, in fact, and s s struggle all the time with trying to employ people who I think can work well with Aboriginal people, yep. who, in fact, are not racist, because um, I think a lot of the time that's what I experience. And I also, of course, see both... Have, well, have to deal with um, government agencies, I think, where there is some structural racism in the way programs are structured, um, and also have to deal from time to time with public servants who just don't seem to be prepared to trust that Aboriginal people possibly know the best way, um, you know, have the best um, knowledge about what's right for them. I just wonder um, whether you have any ideas of how we might be move um, beyond just offering, you know, the, the standard cross-cultural training courses to staff to try to get them to understand Aboriginal issues, to really, really engage as partners and equal partners in working in this. I mean, I was really pleased to hear you sort of talk about, you know, the fact that people, you know, keep coming um, and working, for example, in Aboriginal health services, not doing a very good job, leave, and just, in a sense, collude in something that's going wrong. How do we really get people to take that step to, to be real partners and... Yeah, really create that Look, equality, I suppose. There are a lot of issues in what you've said, but you're really suggesting there's racism. Can I say that if there are people in this room who believe that there is no racism in public service, go and look at the last few Four Corners programs. There was one on the death of Mr Ward. <coughs> I mean, that's an almost unbearable story, isn't it? When you cook a man to death. And to, to the ex-Premier of Western Australia's credit, he said it was the most shameful legacy of his government, Eric Ripper at the ALP conference. But you might have seen that program. And if there wasn't racism evident in that, then I'm afraid I don't understand what the word means. But then there was the drowning of all those Torres Strait Islanders. Was that any different? Look, I think that uh, Chris Sara's experience and the experience of George Hewitson was when they became principals of their schools, they said, this school, I believe, can teach the full curriculum. If you don't think these children are capable of learning the full curriculum, you should leave. And half the teachers left. Railing about racism is very unfashionable in this country. It makes Australians very angry. And so it's a difficult area to discuss. But my view is that, as a community, we have a brilliant record in absorbing migrants. I think 25% of my state of Western Australia is foreign-born. And we have a largely peaceable and equable community. But with Aboriginal people, it seems to be different. And I think when you're dealing with a bureaucracy, you have to find the people who are actually 
able to work with Aboriginal people in a positive way, and it won't be all of them. And I mean, to be quite honest, what I, I've been talking to the federal bureaucracy pretty incessantly lately, because I'm getting increasingly distressed by the gap between good intentions, big resources, and the capacity to deliver. And I drew their attention to the fact that when the mining company that led the reversal of mining company attitude to Rio Tinto, and again, I declare an interest, I'm on in the Rio Tinto Future Fund board, and I'm about to do some work for them. But Rio Tinto led the change in, from 1995 when they had been bitter opponents of native title and of Aboriginal people's rights, the old CRA and all the rest. I know because I fought those people for years. In 1995, Leon Davis made the New Age speech and said, we will work with native title. And ever since, they've tried to work with Aboriginal people, however imperfectly. They do it better than government. But what Rio did was to put 1,800 of their staff through a reculturing. And I know because I participated in it. Now, I, what I said to the bureaucrats yesterday was, perhaps you need to do the same to the Commonwealth bureaucracy. I went to a briefing by Commonwealth bureaucrats at Warrakurna, out near your border, at Giles, the other day. I don't know whether they intentionally or unintentionally were misleading but they were clearly uncomfortable. And when questioned, they had to admit to things they had not bothered to tell people. Now, I think this is a real issue. This is part of the delivery question. You know, I'm not a good cross-cultural communicator, and yet I have got reasonably good relations with lots of Aboriginal people. And the difference is, the reason is, I think, is that they know I respect them. And that's the starting point. And you can smell disrespect on some people. And Aboriginal people pick it up very quickly. So I think you put your finger on a really important area, and it's part of what I call the incapacity of government. I, when I was Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, very young, but with 16 years of contact with Aboriginal people, when I was about, no, I was in my mid, late, mid to late 30s, I'd had a long contact with Aboriginal people, but I inherited a cadre of brilliant officers who'd been trained for three years at the School of Pacific Administration under people like Charles Rowley. For, that's how I would walk on hot coals for Charles Rowley. They were so well trained and they'd spent years and years in the field. People like Bill Gray, Neil Westbury, Mike Dillon. Mike's on the present minister's staff. Neil Westbury wrote a brilliant book with Mike about all this stuff. These guys know it inside out. Wetherill, the state minister here, came to me and said, we've got no trained people. I said, well, go for it. I mean, we send people out to work with Aboriginal communities who wouldn't have a clue. And at least some of them think the people aren't worth bothering about. Witness Four Corners. So, I mean, quite honestly, <laughs> You know, I sat in meetings in Canberra in these very nice office buildings the first two days of this week with good people, really smart people. But the gap between their circumstance and understanding the geographic, the physical, the intellectual gap is huge. And I make this undertaking. I will stop talking about this stuff when I'm no longer talking to Aboriginal people. No longer getting my knowledge from the ground. We are really good at the top-down stuff. We're getting all the top-down stuff right and the bottom-up stuff, which is absolutely central, we haven't really got a clue. Sorry. My, que my questions are always, answers are always too long, I'm sorry. <laughs> First, thank you for mentioning respect, which is so important. My question is about language. Um, I've spent a while on the Pichinjara lands and the people there speak uh, very little English. And um, we'd get a lot of, all the information comes through from government uh, in very bureaucratic English, which they expect the community council to understand, which they simply couldn't. Um, when public servants came through to talk to people about, to consult on various issues, they spoke in bureaucratic English, despite being nudged to um, keep it simple. Uh, there's only a handful of people who 
speak Pichinjara. I'm not one of them. I've tried, but it's hard. Um, I think this situation is probably common to a lot of remote communities. Um, just how would you comment on that? Um, I would think I've probably attended hundreds of meetings where I have not communicated ad adequately. So let me not just point the finger. But this is a huge problem because there are a lot of Aboriginal languages. Um, and how do you... Do you learn just one and then stay always in that location? It's a genuinely difficult problem. But one thing you can do is use interpreters. I mean, that is surely a basic thing, that if you can't speak the language, you're going to use interpreters. Now, the last few meetings I did on the, on the Nunanjara lands, on the other side of the border, there was an Aboriginal man there called Bernard Newbury. Now, Bernard Newbury is just a brilliant interpreter. So I could leave absolutely comfortable that everything I'd said, everything had been said to me, had been conveyed. Uh, if you haven't got an interpreter, then you should start being very, very careful. And you certainly should be very careful using high English and expecting that in one meeting, complex matters will have been processed and dealt with and you'll have responses. The thing that I really liked when I was out in the bush, and particularly if I was camped out in the bush, was if we'd had a meeting and then at night, after you'd gone to bed pretty early because there was not much light, you could hear people talking about what you'd been talking about at the meeting. And there were enough English words popping in, like native title, or <laughs> to know that what you'd been talking about at the meeting had been, was a subject of debate and discussion. And working with the Maru people in the Western Desert, watching the painstaking way they put together the prescribed body corporate, the organisation, you know, we used diagrams, we used plans, we used coloured bits of paper, we drew men and women. We were... But what happened over a period of many months was you had a, a big community internal discussion. And in the end, I'm absolutely satisfied that those people asked for what they wanted and got what they wanted in that structure. Again, it's a problem of timetabling. Out at the meeting at Warrakuna I mentioned, the people were being told about changes which were occurring on the 1st of June, July, 1st of July. Really important changes, fundamental to the way that community operates. That was 13 days before the changes came into operation. The alternative arrangements were not in place. The service providers that had been appointed under the new system the Commonwealth had brought in had no one on the ground. There was no administrative structure to meet it. I mean, so the, the problem you talk about was there of communication, but it was underpinned by a vast problem of a pathetic lack of a business plan. There was no business plan to go from the present to the new, the future. And the problem was the present was working quite nicely. <laughs> Lots of really good things are happening. And the risk is that you destroy what's good before you've put even an equivalent, let alone a better alternative in place. It really is, from a ground level, in my view, terrifying. Terrifying. And contemptuous, actually. It isn't locking people in the back of a van and frying them but it's another form of cruelty and direct incompetence. Well, thank you, Fred, for this is so honest and frank and a fascinating 45 minutes. But thank you, Fred Cheney.